thank you very much, Anya, and it's a real delight to be here and see so many people come to the, the lecture. Um, of course, you know what OBE stands for, Other Buggers Efforts. <laughs> and um, so we put this in here, because it seems to have slipped out. Um, and in my case, that's true, because we've had some fantastic researchers <coughs> over the last few years. Oops, slip my slide change today. Um, so great thanks to them. And they're the ones that really do all the clever stuff, and statistics, and all the papers that we've written. So many thanks to people who work with me over the years. So let's have a think about good bash. Now what I'm going to do today is go through some core issues about the problems that we have as human beings, really. And part of clinical psychology is understanding not just, quote, pathology, but the issue, what is it to be a human being? What has nature given us which can make things difficult? Life can be difficult for us. So we have to remember then that life can be very hard, and we don't want to see you like this after the conference. And when we think about uh, compassion, Compassion really can be defined in many ways, but one of the ways in which we define it is as a sensitivity to suffering and self and others with a commitment to try to relieve and prevent it. And that breaks down into two psychologies. The first psychology is the preparedness to see, to notice, to pay attention to, to engage with. And the second psychology is once you notice and once you're engaged, to develop the wisdom of what to do. So this is important. It's important whether we deal with our own suffering because we know that since the days of Freud, people who struggle with all kinds of emotional difficulties, be it trauma memories, the natural tendency is to try to avoid feeling bad. But in reality, compassion is developing the courage to face the things we don't want to face. And that's true for us both individually, but it's also true for us in the world today. So compassion really begins with a reality check. In other words, the need to look into the reasons that humans can suffer. And the first thing is obviously we are, have biological bodies because these are being built by genes and genes have been designed, genes design your body and your brain to operate in a certain kind of way. You're a member of humanity. So you are designed to want to survive, to struggle, to grasp, to want to avoid pain. You have a whole range of emotional, motivational systems. And we all know that we are born, we grow, we decay, and then die. And along the way, we're susceptible to a whole range of diseases and viruses and injuries. And as the Greeks pointed out, life is very often full of tragedy and pain. We can have great joys too, but none of us avoid the reality that our lives are relatively short, about 25,000 days. It's not long, is it? Um, we're also very socially shaped, and we had a fantastic um, talk this morning by uh, Mary Boy. And we say this to our clients, you know. I say to my clients, look, imagine that I had been kidnapped as a three-day-old baby and brought up in a violent drag gang, right? What would I be like? What would this version of poor girl be like? Well, it wouldn't be like this. I would be a totally different version of me. I'd probably be violent, rather unpleasant. I might even have tattoos, and I hate tattoos personally. <laughs> I might do bad things. I might even be dead now in some drug gang war. We even know that genes are influenced by our environments. We now know that uh, through a process of what is called epigenetics, that genes are changed according to the environments in which people grow. It's called methylation. And that means we have to understand ourselves as contextualized within the biopsychosocial field. And I wrote a paper on this back in 1995, arguing that the core of psychology should be a biopsychosocial model, where we understand the complexities between the ways in which our biologies are, how those biologies are influenced by the social relationships in which we grow, and how those form attitudes and values and so forth. Because in different cultures and in different environments, we are different versions of ourselves. We also know that the ecologies in which people grow up in, whether they're competitive or cooperative, whether they're resource scarce or not, has a major impact on those three interacting systems. And this is important because it's not having a bit of this and a bit of that. It's important because processes co-regulate each other. And as a result of the co-regulation of processes, different patterns emerge. 
So as there, if I was a, kidnapped as a three-day-old uh, baby into a drug gang, what would emerge would be a relationship between the genes that I have and the environment that I have and the context in which I'm <laughs> operating. Let's think about this in terms of the problem of obesity, which was touched on by Christiana earlier. Humans evolved in relatively low calorie environments. We often say that we're hunter gatherers, but in actual fact, if you look at the historical evidence, the men did the hunting and they weren't usually very good at it. So we relied on the women. <coughs> and then you bring in the modern food industry, which is deliberately, deliberately spends billions stimulating your desires for fat, salts, and sugars and you end up with this. Now this is clearly environmental, it's not genetic. But you see, what's happened to poor old David when he went on tour to America? I mean, and I promise that's not me just coming out of the bath. <laughs> so the point is then, we know that where it comes to obesity, it is absolutely being driven by the environment, okay? Now of course, we do try to help people to do what they can to work on their diets and eat healthily and so forth, but if we're going to make any impact on obesity, we have to change how the food industry sells and packages its food. But let's think of some other realities about environments, because this conference is all about social contexts. We know that social class and poverty has a huge impact on education, health, and morality. It's, there are sectors in London where if you go just five miles down the road, there can be a 10-year difference in morality, in mortality. Well, morality, maybe, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, morality and mortality. <laughs> All right. Uh, we know that any city, and there's been a lot of work done on it in the cities, particularly in America, many are uh, hab hab habitated by underserved minorities, really, and these groups were struggling constantly with the stress of everyday living, the shortages relating to poverty. 50% of inner city children have been exposed to severe domestic and community violence, with some studies indicating in some sectors of the uh, environment it's up to 90%. School bullying and crime are very common in some of these areas, so are gang cultures. This is, some of this work was particularly done in Los Angeles. Some studies show rates as high as 50% of in the children are meeting full criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. And even those that aren't, many of them are suffering from sudden syndromal uh, symptoms. <coughs> so this is related to the fact that we are creating communities which are exposing thousands upon thousands upon millions of children to highly toxic environments. And what we also know is that it's not just the symptoms of PTSD, but also, of course, there are many other problems that go with living in high-stress environments which are producing high levels of cortisol, which in fact in, impacts on the frontal cortex and immune system, a lot of medical problems, learning difficulties, prejudice, anger and aggression problems are rife, and so on. So the point about it is there is no question at all that the environment is physiologically impactful. Uh, this is really a story that we really must take out into governments. If there had been a bacteria that had been discovered that caused the kinds of symptoms and kinds of uh, physiological effects that poverty and violence in these communities cause, medicine would have been on it like a flash. But because it's psychological and social processes, governments seem unable to address the fact that we are creating highly toxic environments for children to grow. So the basic philosophy then of the CFT position is that we all just find ourselves here, nobody chooses to be here, we don't choose our set of genes, we don't even choose to be a male or woman, we certainly don't choose our backgrounds which are going to create the versions of ourselves that we are. We're all trying to deal with the tragedies of life because all of us will engage with tragedies, people we love will die, we will come under threats and so on and so on. And the key issue for us then is to recognize that much of what goes on in our minds is not of our design, it's not our fault. Now, this is an important issue really because one of the potential difficulties with some of the therapies we have today, which is focusing on what's going on in the individual, is it also carries a sense of blaming, that something about what you're doing in your head is causing your difficulty. And this really does fit with the sort of uh, traditions of Western society, which is the desire to blame people, then you can punish them. To blame people, then you can send them to hell. But supposing it's not about them, supposing it's built into the system, what about that? 
And so yes, social contexts are extremely important, but I want to argue we also have very severe problems with the way the human brain has evolved. And this is a message that I've been talking about for quite a long time now. Uh, my evolutionary friends just fall to sleep because they say, oh, this is old stuff, we've been talking about this for years. And that is true. So I'm not going to tell you anything particularly new if you're an evolutionary person. But many people don't realize this. Your brain is seriously tricky. It's not very well put together. So let's see why that is. Well, one of the reasons is because you have many functions that go back many hundreds of millions of years. So you, like your pets, your Labrador or your cat, have a whole range of motives that they're there <laughs> seeking to find uh, ways to express themselves. So we, like Labradors, have a desire for sex. We have attachment systems. They look after puppies. We look after babies. We have a desire for belonging. Dogs are group animals, of course. We have emotions, fear, anger, lust, and joy. We have a range of defenses, and all these are very ancient. But we also have a new brain, and this new brain began evolving about two million years. And you have to say, two million years? Oh my God, it was a rushed job. <laughs> and what happens is that this, the way in which the brain, the new brain, the capacity for thinking, for self-monitoring, for having the sense of self interacts with old brain psychology causes trouble. So you'll never see a chimpanzee sitting under a tree taking their pulse thinking, oh my God, that's much too fast, I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> they can't monitor that. Humans can monitor, they can monitor what they're feeling, they can monitor what they're thinking, they can monitor what they think other people are thinking. So you get into these loops. For example, imagine a zebra getting away from a lion. What happens if the zebra can get away is because the stimulus disappears once they're away, they can't see it, smell it, or hear it, the level of arousal will settle down quite quickly. But this doesn't happen for humans, because humans have this new brain, so they start thinking, they start dwelling, they start imagining. Can you imagine if I've been caught? Oh my God, can you imagine me eating a life? You know, seeing my leg ripped off? Can you imagine if I'd been a Christian in the Roman times? And then we start to criticize ourselves. Why on earth did I come and live in this godforsaken place? So the new brain then is able to maintain a whole lot of psychological processes which actually keep our level of stress. We can't turn the loop off, right? This is not your fault. It's part of brain design. Now we can teach you ways that will help you, but it's not your fault. Cognitive distortions are built into the system. We also have to deal with a lot of modern threats. Did you ever worry what happened, wonder what happened to Santa Claus? Well now you know. The key to the story though really, and this is very important for compassion, because compassion is about understanding, looking deeply into the causes of suffering, not turning away, trying to understand what suffering about, is about, is that a mind that doesn't know itself, and this is something that the Buddha actually said two and a half thousand years ago, is a dangerous, cruel and crazy mind. We have minds that are potentially very, very nasty, and we have to take responsibility for that. And the reason is, is because we have a whole range of built-in biases. So there are biases in what we become frightened of, there are biases in how we pay attention to things. We have self-focused biases, we have kin biases. We like to look after our own genes rather than genes of others. So imagine you have a baby and you, they take your baby away to weigh it. They come back an hour later and they say, we have some good news and some bad news. So maybe the bad news first. Uh, we've lost all the tags. We don't know which baby is yours. But we have some good news. We've had some wonderful babies born today, and all you have to do is go down and choose the one you fancy. <laughs> yours might have been a girl, but she'd fancy a boy. Well, now she chose. <laughs> OK, so it doesn't work. We're highly kin-focused, and we're very tribal. We're a very tribal species. You may remember, or you may not know, but Jane Goodall, who was a a primatologist working in the Nom Valley, in the 1980s she discovered something pretty frightening, which is that chimpanzees also go to war. Their group got quite big that she was studying, they broke into a south and north group, and the south group was quite a small group compared to the uh, bigger group in the north. And the bigger group in the north, they hunted down and they killed the chimpanzees in the south. They literally took stones and smashed their heads in. They'd never been seen before. It's been written up. It's now called Chimpanzee Wars. If you put it into Google, you hear about it. So the problem is, what does it mean that we have all these biases? Well, it means that we live in a world where there are children like this, 
and very soon we're going to do that. Well, there are children who live like this, but other of us live like that. We live in a world where we are interested in cruelty, we're interested in causing pain. Even if you want to kill somebody, you're going to kill them in the most painful way possible. Up until 1640, every major city in this country had a torture chamber. If you go to the Tower of London, it's extraordinary what went on there. Right. Humans are potentially nasty. Do you remember this? Well, you won't remember, because you won't lie time, but... Um, <laughs> 700 years Roman games lasted. In the opening of the Colosseum, the first three months of the Colosseum killed 10,000 people. They were dying at the rate of 1,000 a day because they had pitched battles. What about the horrors of war? We're just celebrating is the wrong word. We're just uh, remembering the horrors of the First World War. And this is because we're tribal. And this is what happens to people. And this is how we use our intelligence. And of course, we're also very submissive. We conform, we go along. Philip Zimbardo is actually doing quite an interesting job looking at the people who do not conform with cruelty, who, and it's about 10%. If you put pressure on people, many people just try to keep their head down and they will obey authority, but about 10% don't. And one of the hero projects that he's doing in Stanford is to find out what it is that enables people to stand against cruelty, to not go along with things. So humans are potentially very cruel. Remember slavery, that was only ended 10, uh, 200 years ago, and unfortunately, you might have heard in the news, we've still got an estimated 13,000 slaves in this country, and it's probably more than that. Women as property has been a big issue. Women have done very badly in relation in, over, the, over the centuries, particularly at the hands of men, who tend to see them as being very subservient, only there to serve their own interests. And we do crazy things. For nearly a thousand years, women in China broke the feet of their children. And those children, those people, billions of Chinese women would have suffered enormous pain in their life because of that. Female genital mutation, mutilation still goes on. Domestic violence, it's at epidemic levels, particularly in inner cities. So we have to understand this. Compassion is not some flimsy, whimsy, <laughs> Uh, the process, compassion is the ability to see deeply into the nature of suffering, to understand what we're up against. Then, when we understand it, when we take a scientific approach, we can do something about it. And the point is that this is something that Robert Einstein said a long time ago. Even though we have potential for all this uh, bad stuff, uh, what we actually know now is there is the long, pro I'll just read this, the long progression in our self-understanding has been from a simple and usually intellectual view to the view that the mind is a mixed structure, for it contains a complex set of talents, modules and policies within. All these general components of the mind can act independently of each other. They may well have different priorities. Your mind is full of conflicts. No, it's not your fault. It's absolutely not your fault, but it is. Okay. Freud knew this. He had a whole meta-psychology of what people do about it to try to avoid understanding these conflicts, some of which have not stood the test of time. And nevertheless, humans are full of conflicts. So the point is this, that we have the capacity for being absolutely awful, but we also have the capacity to be the most compassionate species that has ever walked this planet. And that's the issue. We can be devils or we can be angels. And the question is, how do we choose, what do we choose, and how do we cultivate that? So we know there are a whole range of areas where actually compassion wins out. And it's been known for a long time. If you read Buddhism or Christianity, any of the spiritual traditions really tell us that compassion should be at the root of our relationships with each other and our relationships with the world. And it turns out that evolution hasn't just given us a lot of bad stuff, it's given us good stuff too. We have brains that are highly sensitive to kindness. We've got specific areas that are very sensitive to kindness. And we know that when children grow up in loving, caring environments, this has a huge impact on, on gene expression, brain maturation, pro-social behavior, and so on. So it turns out that there are things that we can do about this. Now, one of the things, of course, is people will know, it's called mindfulness. In other words, learning to observe what goes on in your mind. But as you observe it, don't 
blame yourself for it. You want to take control of it, of course. You don't want to act out your anger or whatever it is. But observe this is nature's mind. It's being built for you, not by you. Okay. And the whole point is learning to come back to your inner intent. Now the Dalai Lama has a very nice story about this. When he was a young <coughs> adolescent, he used to like to fix watches in Tibet. So he'd take the broken watches from the travelers and they would come and he'd fix them. And one day he had this beautiful watch. It was a lovely, lovely watch. And he'd been working on it for some weeks. And in the last moment, he dropped a screw into the mechanism. And in that moment of anxiety, in that moment of frustration and irritation, he took a hammer and smashed the watch. And he said to his audience, the problem with that is no more watch. The point about it is that he would say is that in that moment, I allowed what arises within me, my anger, my frustration, to control my behavior because I became less than mindful. And I did exactly the opposite of my true intent. I destroyed the watch. And so the question comes in, what is your true intent? What is your true intent? How do you want to be in the world? What kind of self do you want to bring into the world? How do you want to be with other people? What impact do you want to have, to, do you want to have in the world? And these are very important questions because if you decide, and of course my talk is going to uh, nudge you towards compassion self, if you decide that's the self you want to become, then you know what your true intent is. And therefore, mindfulness becomes a way of recognizing when you're moving away from that. The wisdom, the focusing of this compassion self, which has the courage and the strength to address suffering, and the wisdom of what to do. So mindfulness turns out to be a very useful thing to do. <laughs> there we are. Now, what's important is to recognize that mindfulness is about attention training and compassion is about motivation. Now, motivation is really important because motivation organizes your mind. There's a lot of discussion about, you know, can compassion come from mindfulness and all the rest of it. But in reality, and certainly in the Mahayana and Buddhist traditions, and in other spiritual traditions, Christian traditions, compassion is something you need to cultivate. And the reason that you need to cultivate is because your defenses like your anger or your anxiety, they will turn up without you needing to cultivate them. Nobody lays in bed thinking, you know what? I don't have enough panic attacks in my life. I've got to learn to get anxious. This is ridiculous. I've got to have a few rages, you know? I've got to read through, you know. They are automatic. They will come easily. They will take you over easily, right? The compassion self, the seeds of the compassion self are already in us, but we can cultivate them. So where does that come from? Well, it turns out that a lot of compassion capacity comes from the evolution of caring systems. So poor little turtles, in fact our ancestor was a turtle, we now know that if you follow the genes we had a, a turtle as an ancestor. Genetic side, genetic. Um, they don't have anyone to look after them and so only about one or two percent of them survive to adulthood. But with the mammals, the evolution of the mammals, a whole new game arises because now mammals can be cared for. And that means that they have to have physiological systems that respond to being cared for. And the carer then is able to pay attention to respond to the needs of another. And this is big, this is big in evolutionary, to evolve a brain that can pay attention to the distress of another and do something about it. Now in this case, of course, it's one's own offspring, but nevertheless, these are the basic biological mechanisms that are being put into place. And what we know is that this mechanism, the ability of one mind to have an influence on another, particularly in childhood, has soothing qualities. Okay, it can have playful qualities, but it has soothing qualities, the ability to be soothed by the comfort and the contact with another. And we also know that cooperative and affiliative behavior equally have soothing qualities. They help you to feel safe in the world. And in compassion focused therapy, we use a system which is called the three circle system, and I'll just talk about this very briefly. The evolutionary function analysis sounds very clever. Well, actually, it is very clever. No, not really. um, and all it means is that we understand emotions in terms of their function. So, what is the function of anger? What's the function of anxiety we've discussed? Well, they're all basically defensive emotions, they're all there to protect you. And these are the emotions that are very easy to trigger because they have to be triggered quick. If you're walking along in the jungle and you suddenly hear a lion, you've got to go, right? You've got to go. 
and they're very easy to condition. <clears throat> and they can take you over. And they'll control your attention. So if you go Christmas shopping and you go into 10 shops and in nine shops, the assistants are very kind to you and helpful and then you come out thinking, oh great, I've got a nice present here. But then you go into one shop and the assistant is talking to a friend, you know, and you wait a little bit and you say, excuse me, and they look at you and they say, patience, sir, patience. <laughs> Just feel, you know, feel that hanging there. And then they come to serve you and they're looking at their watch, they're obviously not bothered to serve you. And then you give them 10 pounds, uh, give them, um, then you give them 20 pounds and they give you change for 10. And you say, excuse me, I gave you 20 pounds. And they say, I can't tell you how many people pull that trick on me, Sarah. I can't tell you. So you're, you're fuming. So who do you talk about? Who do you think about when you go home, right? Who, who's gonna, who, what are you going to ruminate on? Okay, you're going to likely ruminate on the one that's really annoyed you. And then you tell your partner and then they get annoyed too. And that's a bit of a problem because anger is not good for your heart, it's not good for your immune system. Now you make somebody you love angry, it's not good for them at all. And hang on a minute, wasn't 90% of your experience good? Why aren't you paying attention to that? Because your brain's not designed to. But you can learn to. You can learn to pay attention to it. You can notice what's arising. Here is my threat system. And uh, this is what happens with many of our clients. They begin to say, ah, this is my threat system. This is my threat system, right? They begin to become aware of what's arising. And then they can have a choice whether they act it out or not. In terms of the blue system, this is the positive affect system. And once again, we can be taken over by positive emotions. We can become addicted to positive emotions. There's quite a lot of evidence now that people working on the stock market are overly addicted to dopamine drive systems, right? Imagine you win a European lottery and you're worth 100 million euros. It's tonight, I've got my ticket in. <laughs> okay. What will happen? You will become hypermanic. Okay? You're worth a hundred million years. You'll be sitting on your mindfulness cushion doing the thank you to the breath. <laughs> oh my god, I'm a million years. <laughs> you won't be able to sleep. I told this to one patient, my, my patient got absolutely gasped. And I'd forgotten he was a paranoid. He said, oh no, Dr. Gilbert. He said, I think if all the people wanted to come and kill me for me money, it would be terrible. <laughs> okay, so activation emotions, dopamine system, sympathetic arousal. But there's another type. And it's very interesting that a lot of society teaches you that happiness comes from achievement and doing, right? Well, yes, but that's very short-lived. There's another form of happiness, which is completely different, which is associated with contentment, well-being, and peacefulness. And this uses a parasympathetic system. And this is related to the ability to be at peace with oneself, to be content. Okay? So what we know is that the sympathetic system speeds up and the parasympathetic slows down. Parasympathetic is sometimes called the rest and digest system. And the parasympathetic is very sensitive to, would you believe, breathing, of course, but also signals of love, care, and affection. Your parasympathetic system is very responsive when it sees friendliness. Okay? So our interactions with each other are stimulating each other's sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. This is very important. And we know that people who've got good parasympathetic tone, they're much more flexible thinkers, they're more likely to be mindful, they have more control over their tension, they're more empathic, and they're much less likely to act out on their emotions. So, we know a little bit then about our potential for cruelty, but we're also learning about our potential for affiliation, our potential for compassion, our potential for caring. We know that when we feel cared for and when we are caring, this stimulates particular systems in our brain. There's another system called oxytocin, which is very important in the process of caring. So let's have a think about affiliation, connectedness, and attunement. Okay, because if these are the basic psychologies that we need to cultivate within us, within our families, within our schools, within our communities, let's think about how they work. Well, it turns out, as I've said, compassion is actually quite old. Look at that. Even carrots. <laughs> affiliation, interestingly enough, combines excitement with the capacity for soothing. 
So affiliation is having joy in your friends, taking joy in being with other people, taking joy in helping other people, taking joy in doing things together, taking joy in helping others, and also soothing. We now know that when individuals are socially isolated and lonely, this has a huge effect on a whole range of physiological systems. Now, I'm not going to go into them, it's probably difficult for you to see. But basically, the, the nutrients of the human brain or affiliative relationships. There's more to it than that, but that is really important. So the point I want to get across is that caring, sharing, and affiliation are not add-ons. They're not niceties, but significantly change the way brains and bodies work. The methylated and myelated parasympathetic nervous system with oxytocin, oxytocin opens the door to social intelligence and socially regulated affect. And if you think about it for a moment, we are clever, but why? Why are we clever? What has been the evolutionary driver? Why do we talk? We talk because we communicate. Why do we have empathy? Because we're interested in what goes on in the minds of others. Right? So if you think about what are the drivers for this thing called intelligence, it wasn't wanting to land people on the moon. It was the social challenges. Being a social being. Sharing, 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 sharing. And it turns out that if we look at what it is to be cared for, we find that being cared for affects genetic expression, stress reactivity, immune system functioning, the development of the frontal cortex, your uh, vulnerability to illness and the way in which you can recover, your core values, your self-identities, and your own, compassion to be, your own capacity to be compassionate and empathic. And so humans, as it turns out, function best in terms of all of those dimensions. Right? This is very clear from the evidence now. When they themselves are loving, affiliative and caring rather than hating, and when they feel loved and valued, these are the nutrients of the brain. There's absolutely no question. And not only the brain, but the cardiovascular system, the immune system, all of these systems are, are primed to be highly tuned by the amount of caring attunement with others that we have. So just to remind ourselves of the definition again now, we can now begin to look at this issue of compassion a little bit more. So we've said that it's very easy for the uh, humans to do bad things, but it's also within our grasp, if you like, for us to think about how do we cultivate the brain to do good things. So. One of the ways of thinking about compassion is the compassion of diamond, which is that we actually learn to engage with suffering, we learn to understand the nature of suffering, we learn to what, uh, what creates suffering both in our genes, in our minds, and in our environments, and in our ecologies, and we set about developing the wisdom for alleviation and prevention, be it within our own selves or within the relationships in which we are embedded. And we're not just focusing on trying to get rid of suffering, but we're also trying to focus on well-being. And that means that we have to think of compassion as flow. Okay? People often see CFT as a self-compassion. We're not a self-compassion therapy. Okay? Self-compassion therapy is Christian Neff's work. And of course, that's much more focusing in on the self when we do do self-compassion, but in the context of flow. So there's the ability for you to be open to the compassion of others. And we train our clients to do that, to notice. Because the, if you're dominated by the threat system, you won't notice when others are helpful or kind to you. You've got to practice paying attention at the Christmas shoppers, okay? Paying attention to the helpfulness of others. And it's quite interesting when you do that, even depressed people say, God, I never really realized. I, I noticed the person on the bus smiled at me today and I, I went and bought my bread and I realized that the person didn't have any rolls and they went to the back to get me some rolls. You know, they start to notice. And then there's the compassion that you feel for other people. How do you do that? How do you build that? And then there's, of course, the compassion that you have for yourself because we have tricky brains. It gets full of stuff, okay? If you look at depression, there's about 300 million depressed people in the world. What do they think? They think I'm a failure, I'm worthless, I'm no good. It's the way the brain is, right? You can't have 300 million all thinking the same thing unless it was a design feature in here. When we get depressed, that's how we think, you know? So it means that there is a psychology of giving. And this psychology involves paying attention in a certain kind of way, developing empathy, but there are also inhibitors and facilitators. So it's much easier for you to be compassionate to people you know than people you don't, 
people you like, from people you dislike, compassionate to the abused rather than the abuser. Okay? And there are some forms of compassion in nature that you're probably never going to see. I love you, I care about your line. I care about you too, Zebra. <laughs> There's also the psychology of receiving compassion, because what we discovered is that many of our people that we work with, they're very resistant to receiving compassion. They find it very difficult to allow compassion to land, and that's often because they've been traumatized or distrustful or whatever it is, but they can't feel it. Even when people are trying to reach into them, trying to be empathic, if anything, it becomes a threat to them. And so what, how do you work with people who are frightened by affiliation? They're frightened by kindness. It's, it's a therapeutic challenge, okay? It's a therapeutic challenge. And compassion focused therapy works with individuals who are indeed frightened of feeling loved, or feeling valued, or feeling wanted. They may feel they don't deserve it. Or it may remind them of other people who are nice to them only to abuse them. There are all kinds of reasons. But it means then that we have to think about the four dimensions, the facilitators and inhibitors of giving, being able to pay attention and so on, and the facilitators and inhibitors of allowing compassion to land and have the impact that evolution designed it to have, which is to help slow you down, to stimulate your parasympathetic, to give you a sense of contentment and safeness. And the point is, if our clients can't allow these signals to land, if they can't ever have an experience of feeling safe and content, they're going to be in trouble because they're going to be stuck in the threat and drive system. And that's how CFT sees it. Okay, just move on from that. So let's think of some of the inhibitors and facilitators, things like liking, being competent, people competent as it, the sense of deservedness, the capacity to be empathic or mentalized, dissociation. When people become overwhelmed with pain, they dissociate. We've done some work in the health service and uh, when nurses are very uh, overstimulated um, in the drive system, do, 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 they start dissociating. They can't hold the suffering of others in mind. Anxiety and depression. The ability to tolerate the stress. Feeling overwhelmed. These are all things which have an impact on our ability to be compassionate, either to receive or not. And because compassion is a motivation, it comes under the normal motivational psychology, right? See, one of the problems with actually having therapies which focus on only one dimension of functioning is that they lose the scientific base that clinical psychologists and psychologists around the world have spent 50 years developing. There is a psychological knowledge base about motivations. We know a little bit about motivation. We know that motivations can be both conscious and unconscious. You cannot crush complex psychology and motivation, emotion, cognition, behavior all into one domain. And so when we know, when we think about stimulating motives, the motive to be compassionate, this is what I'm building up to obviously, it requires all these things. You know, do people have insight into the fact that it's helpful to them or not? Is it voluntary? Do they think they have to do it? Like the skein on in the house service. Do they have a rapid payoff or a slow payoff? Do they enjoy what they're doing or not enjoy what they're doing? What they're doing? Are they supported in their efforts to fulfill their motivation or are they trying to go it alone and there might even be criticism? Are they competent? Do they know what to do? Can they gain the positive or are they trying to avoid the negative? So these are all important things. And there's one other thing I want to say about compassion because people often think compassion is about being nice or kind. It's not quite the same as kindness. Look, if I remember your birthday, that's kind, but we wouldn't call it compassion. The genuine compassion is the ability to pay attention to suffering. And that means that compassion has to evolve courage. Now, I'm personally not particularly religious myself, but whether or not you are religious, the idea, the idea that Jesus came to save us from our sins is extraordinary. The preparedness to suffer for others, and that actually is at the heart of the Christian ethic, the preparedness to suffer for others. And that takes a lot of courage. And so the key issue for, 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 for us is helping people understand that, that the root of compassion is courage. And when you're working with clients, at the root of the compassion that you help them develop is courage. Developing the courage to begin to face the trauma of the abuse. The agoraphobia begins to develop the courage to go out, to face the anxiety, to face the fear of having a heart attack or whatever it is. The obsessional person begins to 
develop the courage to bit by bit take on the obsession. So let's think about the evidence then. What about the evidence? Is this developing this inner compassion motivational system? So this is the self I want to become. This is what I'm going to cultivate. What is the data? It's going to be brief, I'm afraid. Well, we know, and there's quite a lot of evidence now, that if you practice imagining compassion from others, you can actually produce changes, physiological changes, which are measurable in the frontal cortex. And the reason for this is because we now know the brain is far more plastic than was ever understood even 15 years ago. It's called neuroplasticity. The brain produces about five to 6,000 new brain cells each day. That's called neurogenesis. And those cells go to areas where they're being stimulated, where they're being used. So this is very exciting work because psychologists really are beginning to get onto this. And incidentally, the psychologists around the world that's doing a lot of this physiological stuff and compassion, because supposing we can develop trainings for people that will actually have an impact on how their brains and bodies are. Wouldn't that be amazing? Loving kindness meditation, this is uh, Barbara Fredrickson's son's work, increases positive emotions, mindfulness, feelings of purpose in life, sense of social support. Compassion meditation just for six weeks actually improves immune function. So th th these are not psycholo just psychological phenomena. You're actually changing major physiological systems. And the paper that came out just recently, helping others, you know, this study looked at the degree to which people were helping others in their communities, they're actually poor communities, actually um, predicts reduced mortality specifically by buffering the association between stress and mortality. So if you're an individual who likes helping other people, this is good for you. Let's think of a study by Jennifer Crocker and Akarivalio. They looked at compassion self-image goals, which were assessed by 13 items, all began with the phrase, in the past week, in the area of friendships, how much did you want to try to do the following? So for um, compassion goals it was, well I wanted to be supportive, I wanted to have compassion for others' mistakes and weaknesses, avoid doing anything that would be harmful to others, make a positive difference to somebody's life, be constructive, etc. But there's also what they call ego goals, or what we would call shame avoidant goals, which is, I wanted to get others to recognize or acknowledge your positive, my positive abilities, qualities, convince others that you are right, avoid showing your weakness, avoid the possibility of being wrong. So those are all shame avoid, right? And you can imagine what the data tells you, that if you're motivated, if you're orientated to be compassionate, if that's what you're focusing on with your friends, then compassion goals predicts closeness, clear and concerned feelings, increased social support and trust over the semester, whereas the more self-image goals you had, the less that was the case. And if you had high self-image goals, you're very concerned about being seen as weak or whatever it is, that produced uh, predicted conflict, loneliness, and confused feelings and so on. And so we know now that we don't know, and there's been many other studies as well, that shows us that actually uh, the motivations that you have in your relationships have a major impact on a whole range of stuff. So basically then, what we're suggesting is, in order for us to deal with this tricky brain, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be teaching people the importance of understanding that the human brain is a serious problem, right? Because you can very easily tip it into doing bad things. Not, not, not people's fault, but if we can train people to be mindful, okay, and if we train people to have compassionate motivation at the heart of their being, this will have a major impact on how that brain is. And for those of you who are clinical psychologists, it is the context, it is the supports around which you then do your intervention. <coughs> so we say building compassion is like climbing Mount Everest, right? If you want to climb Mount Everest, it's a good idea to get fit first. So if you're going to start working with people who are very frightened or whatever it is, it's a good idea to build capacity in the breathing, in the body, in the parasympathetic system, and then start working with the things they're frightened of. In terms of the evidence for C and T, um, well, we, we did a study some time ago. I did it in the day hospital. I went to my day hospital. I work in the day hospital. I went to, uh, it's my the people that I said, look, I've got, I've got this thing called compassion focus therapy. I'd like to do a group. Would you do a group with me? And they said, oh, not another one of your bloody therapies, Gilbert. I said, no, this one's going to work. I promise you, it's all right. It's 
Anyway, so um, nine of them um, uh, signed up for it, and um, they were fantastic, and they told us where we were doing wrong and what had helped them and so on. So we showed major changes in shame, self-criticism, and these are people who have been in the service a long time. Um, <clears throat> Lorna Judge, who's actually here in Glasgow, did a lovely study with uh, 27 clients in community mental health, whoops, sorry, 20 mental health teams, and again, showed significant reductions in depression, anxiety, and shame, and self-criticism. Self-criticism, you see, is the thing that we often go after, because if you have a self-critic in your head, what you're going to be doing is stimulating the threat system day in, day out. Okay. That, that voice will stimulate it in your head. And in actual fact, that's how we started in compassion focused therapy. We were doing cognitive therapy, and people could do alternative thinking, you know, could generate alternative thoughts, uh, but the emotional texture of those thoughts was very negative. So I remember one lady, she had been adopted in, into a very bad environment, and she felt unlovable and unwanted, but she'd had a good marriage, and she had daughters who loved her, so she was able to write those down as alternative thoughts, right? She said, Yes, I know that my husband loves me and my kids love me, but. When I look at it written down like that, it doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, I know it's true, but... So I so, said, well, how are you actually hearing it in your mind? She said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, what's the tone? She said, what? You know, like... I said, well, speak it out as you hear it. She said, what? So, you're having cognitive therapy, huh? Well, look at the evidence, right? You've got a husband who loves you. You've got children who love you. For God's sake, that's black and white thinking, isn't it? That's right. So the tone, the emotional tone... So um, we said to her, well, maybe we could just change the tone, you know, get a kind tone to the alternative voice. And that proved a lot more difficult than we thought. But you see, the thing is, the tone, the emotional context of what, how you say things is important. I could say to you, uh, everybody wants to be happy. And I could say to you contemptuously, everybody wants to be happy. Or I could say, everybody wants to be happy. Or I could say sexy. <coughs> Everybody wants to be happy. <laughs> Army men, right? <laughs> Another study here, Heather Lathwaite, Janice Harper, looking at uh, people with psychosis and casters. Once again, uh, some major changes in uh, the measures that we usually measure, shame and so on and so on. And another study that again was done here in Glasgow, I picked out the Glasgow ones by Christine Brailer and her team, which was an RCT looking at people with psychosis. And the great thing about this trial was the fact that in building a compassion group, they actually were facilitating being compassionate to each other. So when you're doing compassionate groups, you're not doing challenging thoughts and all that stuff. You're developing the capacity to be empathic and mentalize each other. Okay. So I want to just finish off now by talking a little bit about how can we widen the focus? Because basically, how do we get these basic ideas that psychology, psychological science, over the last 20 years have proved, in my view, without a shadow of a doubt, compassionate motivations are physiologically very powerful. There are lots of other things as well, you know, social relationships and all, you know, other stuff, but I'm just going to focus on the physiological side. How can we bring it into healthcare? How can we bring it into relationship building? How can we help couples understand how to be compassionate to each other, how to deal with conflicts. How can we bring it into organizations and schools? How can we make compassionate communities? We heard a, a wonderful talk by um, Tony and Emma uh, about the, ch uh, um, the children's, pro um, young people's project just earlier on. And the reason for this is because compassion organizes your mind. It's a motivational system. If you're competitive, right? If you're focused on being a banker and make a lot of money, then the way you think about yourself and your relationships, the things that give you pleasure, are going to be very different than if you had that one. So one of the ways in which we've been talking to people within organizations is the following. We'd like you to imagine that there are two different motivating systems. One is uh, competitive, threat-based competitive, and the other is affiliative. Supposing that you think about this, how will this organize the mind, your mind? or the mind of your employer, employee. How will it affect your job role? If you're being very competitive, how will that affect what you do in your job? In comparison to if you're being very compassionate, very co cooperative. How does it affect how your 
job role, you relate your job role to your team colleagues. Do you really want to have a whole lot of individualistic, competitive people who are trying to put each other down in the race to get ahead? Is that what you want? How will it affect how your colleagues link to your managers? How will that affect how your organization is work? What is at the root of your organization? If you create a lot of competitive dynamics, right, where people will start to cut corners in order to get ahead, in order to um, satisfy output figures, you're going to have trouble. And what about society? If you are a, a business that has compassion at its root, what kind of organization will you create? Well, you create an organization where individuals are much more likely to be less burnt out. You create an organization where individuals are much more likely to be focused on quality. You create an organization where you have bottom-up problem solving. You have an organization where you have more client loyalty. You have more creativity. We know that when individuals feel supported and valued in their organizations, they go the extra mile. They're creative have lower sticks rates, lower bullying rates, and you'll have a company that follows ethical guidelines. So this is important. What about schools? Supposing we help children recognize the importance of developing compassionate motivation as part of a self-identity. How is that going to influence their ability for learning, their openness to learning in comparison to just being competing, right? We've got obsessed with the concept of competing. Competing is a motivational system that will do things to our minds. We've got to understand that. If you're compassionate, how will that affect your relationship with other pupils? How will that impact on how you relate to authority? How will that impact on how the school relates as an organization to society in general? So understanding then the motivational systems are key to our own minds but also organizations and also our communities and also our countries is absolutely essential. So compassion then is based partly on the desire to do good and will be compassion focused, it improves coping, we're coming to the end now, it improves, increases happiness, has an enormous impact on well-being, it improves creativity, it changes a whole range of physiological symptoms, systems and it promotes pro-social behavior. So I'd like to finish then with this slide. Putting compassion at the heart of psychology. We have a hard-won science about the role of affiliative behavior on a whole range of processes. The mind, our mind and cultures really are like gardens and they will grow. But without thought and wise cultivation, they can grow for good or bad. Human history is not terribly good. But we can change this because we have science now. We can know what it is that helps us cultivate the good. So as we better understand how nature has built us, we can take responsibility for creating and cultivating the conditions for each human being to flourish. We can put this new brain that can cause us trouble to good uses. Psychology can and should be at the forefront of the science in this endeavor by putting compassion at its heart. Thank you.